celebrate this morning. Yeah. You may be seated. Man, it's so good to be with you this morning. I just got a few announcements. I'm going to get back into worship. Sound good? Cool. So first off, um, on uh, behalf of the Gray family and, um, and uh, the church, just want to say thank you to everyone who has continued to support the Gray family during this troubled time. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing if you've ever been in a tight spot um, to know that you have people who love you, um, who want to take care of you. And so as we continue to support them, uh, just thank you for that. Uh, Sugar Rush. Who's excited about Sugar Rush? I can just tell. I can tell so many people. Hey, um, I'm excited, and here's why I'm excited. Uh, last week, uh, Ricky brought a request to the church. We had six prizes that we wanted sponsored. And I'm proud to tell you that one week later, all of the prizes have been sponsored. So thank you so much, church family, for taking care of that. We are still taking candy donations. And if you're like, ah, Brad, you know, I don't really want to go to Walmart, but I'll happily send you to Walmart. You can come by the office and just drop off a monetary donation and we'll do the shopping for you. Sound good? Amen. That's right. Who doesn't love going to Walmart? Especially now. <laughs> hey, Wednesday nights, we're having so much fun. Um, over at, uh, at Youth in the Family Life Center and then First Baptist Kids um, meeting over here in the Ed Building. And so if you've not been a part of that and you are uh, pre-K through 12th grade, get on down there this Wednesday and let's have a good time together. Sound good? Um, also on Wednesday nights in the chapel, um, the adults are still going through Grasping God's Word book. And so if you'd like to be a part of that and you're not already, um, that's at 6 o'clock in the chapel. And so are the uh, youth services. Tuesday night, Celebrate Recovery and Divorce Care are both happening. Um, we meet in the Family Life Center for worship at 6. There's food at 5.30. It's free. If you know somebody who uh, has a hurt habit or hang up, um, which would be all of us, and uh, would like to come together with some other people and see about getting some godly advice about those things, um, come on down and uh, join us. And uh, finally, if you see on the bottom of your bulletin, uh, we are online and you can find us there. And so if you're the type of person to get online, if you're not, that's okay too. Cool? Awesome. Hey, that wasn't so bad, was it? Let's worship together. Come on, will you stand with me? Let's 
let us sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, Jesus, the name, Jesus, the name above every other name, Jesus, the only one who could ever save, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
first one will declare this. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Yeah. I am a child of God. Amen.
and good morning. Good, morning. good to be here with you this morning. I want to say a word of thanks to, to Brad and the team for leading us in worship. I tell you, when you stop and, and think about the songs we're singing and the, the significance of them, uh, the Lord Jesus has set us free from so much, so much fear, so much worry, so much doubt. And, uh, and we have the opportunity to gather and, and declare how great he is Sunday after Sunday. So I want to thank you for doing that this morning. My name is Marcus Brown, and uh, I am on staff at the Arkansas Baptist State Convention. Uh, I, uh, I've been serving down there for um, about to wrap up my 12th year, and I uh, serve, uh, have served for several years on the evangelism team, and, and, uh, and so now uh, I have the privilege of, of sharing with you today. I am from this area. I was born and raised in, uh, in the Mansfield area. And I think I, I shared with you, preached for you um, about a year and a half ago. So some of you may remember my Mansfield connection. My parents still both live there. And so, uh, matter of fact, we spent the night with them last night. My family is going to drive over and join me for, uh, for the 1030 service uh, this morning. And so really excited to be here with you today. And, uh, and thank you for that. I want to say a word of, of welcome and, and appreciation on behalf of our executive director, Dr. Sonny Tucker, who I think is going to be preaching next Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he's going to be here uh, next Sunday to, to share with you. And, of course, there's about 1,550 Arkansas Baptist churches around the state. And so I want to thank you for your partnership in doing missions uh, with those. Of course, all, all y'all, a lot of y'all know Justin Hall. Of course, he serves down there on uh, state convention staff. And, uh, and it's just a, a privilege to be able to be a part of what God is doing around the world. And sometimes we may get a little discouraged about what's going on in our world, but we have to be reminded that the, the God of the Bible, the God over all that is, he is still at work and he's at work globally and he is bringing revival globally in certain areas. People are giving their lives to Jesus Christ uh, by the thousands. And so I want you to be encouraged by that and the fact that you as an Arkansas Baptist and as a Southern Baptist have a role to play in that. People are hearing the gospel for the very first time because of the way in which you give the mission through the cooperative program. And, uh, and so I just want to say a word of thanks to you. Of course, I'm a uh, good friend with Jeff Thompson. I know he's been here with you and, and, uh, and even before Eric came was your interim pastor for a long time. And so really have an appreciation for him. I pastored in Concord Association. Uh, while he was associational missionary there. So it's just good to be able to, to worship with you this morning and to acknowledge that regardless of where we, we live, I currently live in Benton, and my church is down there worshiping right now. Regardless where we are, we worship the same Lord Jesus Christ who has saved us and set us free. And so I want us to be able to look into God's Word this morning and, uh, and focus on a passage of Scripture that's going to be in Romans chapter 1. If you would be looking in Romans chapter 1, uh, today uh, marks the conclusion of an emphasis that's taking place across our state. Uh, you may be aware of it. It's 21 days of prayer and fasting. And uh, so to start the year, actually January 4th was the day that this, this emphasis started where, uh, where we as Arkansas Baptists were called to spend the next 21 days praying to the Lord for revival and asking Him to do what only God can do. And, and so we have spent these last 21 days uh, expressing our brokenness and a desire for God and a desire for God to move in our lives, a desire for Him to move through our churches and to move through lost people in our nation and to open their eyes. And so if you haven't done that, just because it officially ends today doesn't mean you can't do that. That information is all online and it's available and you can engage in that in the next 21 days and it's at absc.org. You can just Google Arkansas Baptist State Convention and you'll be able to find 21 days of prayer by doing that. But, but we really do believe God is still on his throne. He always has been. He is going to be on his throne for all of eternity and it's just our privilege to know him and get in on what he is doing. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage you along those lines. Now, let us read a verse of scripture this morning that for many of you is going to be fairly familiar. So allow me to read verse 16 of Romans chapter 1, where it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. Now let's talk about shame for just a moment. I don't know about you. I don't know how long it's been since you found yourself in an embarrassing situation. But I, I know, for example, this past Friday, I was down, again, living in the Benton Bryant area. 
And um, I was running an errand, and as I was, I was driving by this little antique kind of flea market shop that is there in the Bryant area. I'd never been in before. I, 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 I kind of like to yard sale, okay? I don't know how you feel about me admitting that, but any, any yard sailors in here, anybody like that? Well, I, I, I kind of enjoy that, and so the winter's a tough season for yard sales, so that's when I go to antique shops and that kind of thing just to look. And never been in this one, and so I, I stopped in there, and they had all these booths that were set up that you, you build around in, and, and so as I'm, I'm in one of these looking at whatever the, the items were that they had in this particular booth, an older lady comes by, and, uh, and, and she, I stop, and it's obvious she wants to say something to me. Of course, we both got our masks on, so, so, but it's, it's apparent she's about to talk, and so I make eye contact with her, and here's what she said. Here's how it starts. Exactly these words. She said, oh, and another thing. Okay, that's a weird phrase. Never seen this lady in my life. <laughs> oh, and another thing. I am also looking for some end tables. <laughs> okay, so this is her first sentence. And, and, and she began to describe these end tables, and she said they have six sides to them. And she said, have you ever seen any of these before? I said, yes, ma'am. As a matter of fact, I have. My parents used to have a set of those, and, and I remember them very well. And she said, yeah. And she, she went on. She said, yeah, I'm looking for those. I need two of them. And they need them in a dark color, kind of a mahogany. She goes on in all this detail. And, yes, ma'am, that was the color my parents had. And, and she said, I've looked at them online, but you never know what you're going to get online. And so I just haven't ordered any of these. And I said, I understand entirely. She said, so if you see any of those, I would really appreciate that you let me know. <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, I would be glad to. I said, I must confess to you, I don't actually work here. Oh, oh, my lands. Oh, I am so embarrassed. I thought you were somebody else. She, just, she was just mortified that she had explained to me these end tables she wanted. Now, I did end the conversation and told her, I said, if I come across any of them in, while I'm shopping, I'll come hunt you down and I'll tell you where they are. But she was just embarrassed. I don't know how many times you've ever had a moment where you were just embarrassed. Anybody ever had an embarrassing moment? We're not going to have you stand to your feet and testify to these embarrassing moments. But if, when I ask you that question, a moment probably popped into your mind, something that now you look back at and you laugh at, or something you look back at and you're still mortified and can't believe you, uh, you ever actually did that. But we've all had those embarrassing moments. I can remember, remember several of those in my past, and I chose not to, not to share those with you this morning. Now let me ask you this question. What, what's something you're ashamed of? Yeah, it's a little bit of a different question. Now, they may be one and the same, but, but the embarrassing moments you look back at and go, oh, I can't believe I did that. That was so embarrassing. But what is something you're ashamed of that's happened in your past? It's not a pleasant thought to consider those things that I look back on and think, well, it was a moment when, when I should have been prepared and wasn't, and I looked foolish doing that, or... It may be something all the way to the perspective of you were caught in a sin. And, and you think back on it and think about how shameful that was. We're reminded in the Garden of Eden, in, in the, the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, that there in Genesis chapter 2, God creates the man and the woman. And he puts, he puts them both in this, this perfect place, this garden. And, and as, as many of you already know, and if you, you're not familiar with this, let me encourage you to go back and read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. But... In the garden, the Lord said, you can do anything you want to. There's nothing off limits for you except for this one thing, and that is you cannot eat from this one particular tree. It's got fruit on it. It looks good. You cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you do it, you will surely die. And so we're able to see that God gives them that command, and at the end of chapter 2, it says, interestingly, it says they were both naked and they felt no shame. They were not ashamed. They weren't embarrassed, none of those things. It was a perfect existence. And then you come over to Genesis 3, and in Genesis chapter 3, that's where it describes when, when Satan tempted Eve and, and began to convince her, hey, the Lord really doesn't know what he's talking about. He just doesn't want you to be like him. There's some special knowledge here that you can get if you eat this fruit, and she gives in to the temptation. And do you remember what happened the moment they ate the fruit? The Bible says all of a sudden their eyes were opened, and they were filled with shame. They realized they were naked. They were embarrassed. They were, they were ashamed. And then it says there, and it says that they made coverings for themselves out of fig, fig leaves. And then it goes on to say some of the most tragic words in all the Bible, seemingly. They heard the Lord coming. And when they heard the Lord coming, what was their reaction? They went and hid. I mean, just how tragic is that? that and that's a whole other message for a whole other day. The notion that... 
that in their sin, their reaction in their shame was, we want to get away from God. We do not, we, we can't be in the presence of God. We've got to hide from Him as a result of our shame. And, and that's what sin results in. It results in shame. Human nature says, I must conceal my sin. I must conceal my guilt. It is shameful. And so I stand before you this morning. We might as well go ahead and get this out of the way. I stand before you as a terrible sinner. There's no other way to describe it. I'm a terrible sinner. I have failed God miserably. And I stand deserving judgment from Him. It is shameful what human beings think. It is shameful what, what human beings plan. And what actions human beings engage in. We find that our sin makes us filled with shame. We find this verse of Scripture says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Let, let's talk about the gospel for just a second. You're familiar with that phrase, the gospel, those words. What is the gospel? I don't know if you've ever done this before, but let me encourage you sometime in the very near future to find somebody and say, hey, have you ever heard the, the word gospel before? Do you know what the, the, the term the gospel means? And see what their reaction is. You know, I mean, for, for many of us, having grown up in, in, in Arkansas and certainly western Arkansas here in the, uh, you know, I, I grew up out in, out in the middle of nowhere. When you turned the lights off, it was dark, that kind of thing. The stars was all you had. And so uh, when I encounter somebody, I assume they have a familiarity with Jesus, familiarity with the gospel. But it, uh, there, there have been numerous times when I've asked people down near where I live, have you ever heard of the term the gospel? To which they say, no, I don't guess I've ever heard that in my whole life. That's the world we find ourselves in these days. Of course, we, many of us, you, you know the gospel literally means good news. And, and yet we open the pages of the Bible and what we find describing the situation is that, that sin entered into the world there in Genesis chapter 3. And so here I stand before you today. I'm a sinner. I've chosen to rebel against God. I am completely depraved. There's nothing good in me. I'm totally corrupt. And as a result of that, I am filled with shame, and, and I despair, and I'm filled with hopelessness. And, and you may be sitting there thinking, well, what's good about that? That sounds terrible. And it is terrible. And if it's been a while since you've considered your sinful condition, let me encourage you to think for a moment about what it's like for people as a result of our sin. When we chose to rebel against God, when we rejected His best and chose to disobey Him, the plight that we as human beings find ourselves in... What is so good about that? Well, I'm thankful for the fact that in this verse of Scripture, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Praise the Lord for the fact that the Bible goes on to tell us that though I'm a sinner and though my relationship with God was destroyed as a result of my sin, God still loves me. And I want you to know today, if you're in this room or if you're watching online, God loves you. He loves you. I'm a terrible person. If you'll allow, some of you may have never met me in my life, you are a terrible person, all right? That's just the truth. The Bible says that's the way it is. And God loves you anyway, even though we're sinners. And even though we deserve to be dead in our sin and destroyed because of our sin. And God loves us so much that even though I deserve to be separated from Him forever, He provided a way for us to be saved and that is through the sending of His Son, Jesus. And Jesus lived this, on this earth and He never sinned, never once did He do anything in violation of God's righteousness and holiness and His standard. And then Jesus died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. And then three days later, He rose from the dead to demonstrate He didn't just talk about being able to save people. He had the power to save them. Jesus Christ can free us from what we deserve as a result of being sinners. And we're declared righteous by, before a holy God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. The, the gospel is indeed good news. You know what the gospel is about? The gospel is about the fact that my shame has been taken away. Praise the Lord. Though I am a terrible sinner and though I deserve condemnation, I have been completely forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ and through the resurrection that he enjoyed from the dead. What can wash away my sin? 
Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And another hymn that we sometimes sing is, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. That is why it is well with my soul. That is why we sing. That is why we worship. The Lord Jesus Christ defeats my shame. Now, with that in mind, the Apostle Paul here says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. We know that as he makes that statement there, as he's writing to the Christians in Rome, he's, he's speaking of a different shame. When he, when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he's not talking about the shame that, that comes about as a result of my sin and my separation from, from the Lord. He's not speaking of a shame that, that causes me to stand guilty before God. Instead, he's speaking of actually being ashamed of the gospel itself. This is a whole, whole different subject, a whole different matter. It's a big issue for us. You can probably relate. Have you ever found yourself kind of ashamed of of maybe trying to share the gospel with someone. That's why the Apostle Paul writes to that young pastor by the name of Timothy in 2 Timothy. And he says, Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel of God who has changed you and called you to a holy life. Well, you can talk about, you can talk about spirituality. You can talk about God. And you, you can talk about all those kinds of things all day long, but the moment you say the name Jesus, it's a game changer in a conversation. I mean, you can say God bless you all day long, but if you, if you start talking about Jesus, it changes things because, because of, of a couple of things. One is, you can't talk about Jesus and what He's done for us without talking about our sin. And nobody wants to be told they're a sinner. You know, can you imagine if I walked, if I knocked on your door and you opened the door and I said, hey, I just wanted to swing by today and, and just tell you what a terrible sinner you are. I already know about you and you're a terrible sinner. Imagine how you'd receive that. That's not well received. Nobody wants to be told they're a sinner. But a person can't understand their sinful condition and their need for a Savior without coming to terms with how terrible we are in comparison to the holiness of God. People don't want to hear it. And the other reason the name of Jesus is so offensive is because the Bible teaches the only way to be set free from your sin is through Jesus Christ. And we live in a world where that is not a popular message at all. We live in a world where as long as you're sincere, surely it's going to work out for you. That, that God, He knows everybody's sincerity and, and He's going to let them in, whether they're Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or Christian, they're all going to be okay, but the moment you say Jesus is the only way to be saved, you're looking for a fight because you're saying all these other people are wrong. I heard that not too long ago. I heard that from an individual who told me, you mean to tell me you're standing there and saying that all these other well-meaning people who are devout in their faith, they are not going to enjoy a relationship with God because they're not willing to accept your, your message, Jesus, as you preach it. And it, it's, it's not what I say. It is what God in His holy word says. I don't, I don't have a decision in this matter. Praise the Lord, it's not up to me. And, and God through His word says, only Jesus saves. Only Jesus saves. And it's not because I have insider information or because I'm good or because the West is, has got some special permission. It is because the Bible tells us it is only Jesus. And it's by His grace that we have been able to enjoy His word and have our eyes open to the truth. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Ma Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, You will be hated for my name's sake. Hmm. What about you? You ever been afraid to share the gospel? You ever been afraid to take the plunge into a conversation and, and bring up Jesus and, and, and the message of the gospel? It's understandable. There's doubts about adequacy, effectiveness, being accurate. 
I mean, we, we can play all these things out in our mind, all these reasons why it's a bad idea to transition the subject from the conversation at hand, small talk, to how Jesus can transform their lives. The fact of the matter is, you may be afraid to share your faith, but we, we can never, ever be ashamed to share our faith. Let, let that one soak in for just a moment. And, and let me say to you this morning, just very briefly as, as I conclude, well, there is no shame in the gospel. Why is there no shame in the gospel? There is no shame in the gospel because the gospel is true. It is true. And let me say that if you came across a cure for cancer and you were 100% certain that it really would cure everybody with cancer, what would you do with that message? I would like to think that out of a compassion for humanity, we would spread the word. And there would be people who would scoff at us and say, you're crazy, it can't be that, that can't be the cure. We would share it anyway because we would want people to live. I stand here today admitting wholeheartedly, believing wholeheartedly that the gospel message is true. If you doubt that, let me invite you to investigate it. Let me invite you to investigate whether or not a supreme being really did create the universe and everything that is, is in it. When you start drilling down, you realize it is really, really hard to believe any alternative other than there was a God who created it all. And science bears that out. We as believers don't need science to bear that out, but science bears out that there was a beginning and there was something behind the beginning. It stands up to scrutiny. You can study how the Bible came to exist and, and people talk about, oh, it's just your book and you, you, it's your thing and you do that and others will do theirs. You, you look into how the Bible stands up against other holy books in the world and you will acknowledge it is set apart. It is different. It is op you, can, you can try to poke holes in it all day long and you are going to be shocked at how it stands up to the scrutiny. See, people may not believe, but it's not because of lack of evidence. They don't believe because they choose not to believe. They don't want to believe the truth because when, it, when they believe the truth of the Bible and the gospel, they have to come to terms with their sin. And nobody wants to be told they're a sinner and that somebody else has to solve their sin problem. I want you to know that we have an event on the state level there at, at, coming out of the, the Arkansas Baptist State Convention called Lead Defend. And it's an annual event, and it takes place there at Emanuel Baptist Church in, in Little Rock. And it is designed to equip high schoolers and college students on how to, how to be familiar with the gospel and share it in a way that they can, I say defend it, it doesn't need defense, but that they can, they can share why it is true. And so let me encourage you to look into that. You can find that again on that website that I shared with you. It's Lead Defend Conference, and it's taking place March 6th in Little Rock. Listen, we're not arrogant about our faith. We better not be arrogant about it. But we are confident, and it gives us great boldness. We can be bold in our faith. Our kids are being told, science tells us there's no need for God. Science tells us this. Science tells us that. That's just not true. The people that are sharing that message start from the premise, there's no way there's a God. And then they're left trying to figure out the solutions. And our students need to know that the message of God, the message of the Bible, it stands the test of time and it endures. Because the God who created is the God over science too. And they don't have to, they don't have to fear that. The message that we have not only gives great hope, it is true, it is it. it we can be filled with boldness over that. Not only is it true, it's for everyone. I love this. It says, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It talks about the Jews and the Greeks in this passage of Scripture. Jews and Gentiles. Our culture, our nation, it is fragmented, is it not? If we just, we just see this, if you pay attention to the news, you, 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 you either throw your hands up in the air and discuss, or it drives you to your knees, praying and asking God to have mercy on us. What does the future hold? I'm telling you, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only answer to the problems this world faces. And it is for everyone. It doesn't matter what our skin color. It doesn't matter what our economic status is. It doesn't matter where we live. It is for 
everyone. And, and I know y'all are thinking, where's he going with this? But uh, we're, we're well aware of the, the, the casino over in, in Pecola, and I remember when it was built and all that. Well, well, on my way from my house to the office, the, the office, I live in Benton, the office is in Little Rock. On my way, there is actually an advertisement for Choctaw Casino right there in my little commute. Okay, that's a long way to go. I guess a lot of folks drive for that kind of thing. But nonetheless, they have a sign up there. And on the side, here's what it says. It says, exclusively for everyone. Exclusively for everyone. Now, now I realize it's advertising a casino, all right? So, but, but when I saw those words, I thought, that is a great description of the gospel. Because it is exclusive. You only have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. But the great part about it is, it's exclusively for everyone. It is for everyone who comes to Him by faith. And so there's no shame in the gospel because it is true. There's no shame in the gospel because it is for everyone. It doesn't matter who you encounter. It is for everyone to be able to enjoy a relationship with God. And then finally, there's no shame in the gospel because it is indeed the power of God for salvation. I have been saved. I have been set free. If I die in a car wreck on the way back home to Benton this afternoon, I have nothing to fear. I'm going to be in the presence of my Creator and Savior for all of eternity. I have been freed from sin. I have been set free from fear, as we sang a moment ago. We're no longer a slave to those things. What is there to be ashamed of? And then when we consider the fact that there are people that we walk beside every day who are living in darkness and who are enslaved and who are set, aren't set free and they need the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the call for us to not be ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You know, the bad news is wages of sin is death. No one has the ability to stand before God on their own merit. And, and you, you think about the worst news. The worst news is that I deserve to be condemned to hell and separated from Him forever and ever. Now, there's some good news. The good news is that God made a way for us to be saved through Jesus. Jesus came, died for our sins. The best news is you can have what God offers today through faith. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful you don't have to get cleaned up before you come to Jesus? I'd never be able to come to Him. Aren't you thankful that, that those problems that we encounter, the shame we live in, I don't have to, have to change my ways before I come to Jesus? You come to Jesus and He will empower you to change and become as He has called us to. This morning, I want to invite you, if you would, please bow your heads and close your eyes. And as you do, I'm going to ask Brad and the band, if you all would, make your way up here. And, and, and for those of us in this room who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, I, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want you for just a moment, to, as we've already done throughout the service, but I want you to spend a moment in thanksgiving to the Lord. And you just, for, the, for this time, you just think about what life would be like if you didn't have hope that God has made available to you through faith in Jesus Christ. Imagine the crises you've been through, financial crisis, health crisis, grief that you've endured. Imagine what life would be like if you didn't have Jesus. And as we, as we thank God for the fact that He has saved us, even though I am so undeserving of that salvation, then allow your mind in prayer to go to the people around you, just to your day-to-day -day life, what this afternoon is going to look like, what Monday is going to look like the rest of this week. Imagine, imagine the people around you that you just don't know for sure where they stand in relationship with God. They're, they may be, they may have a terrible reputation. People may know that what they do is shameful. They may have a good moral reputation. But there's going to be a lot of shameful, wicked people that are separated from God forever. There are going to be a lot of moral people who are separated from God forever because I'll never measure up to the standard of holiness. And so this morning, I want to invite you to spend a moment praying and asking God certainly to save them that's ultimately the goal but pray and ask God for boldness 
Are you ashamed of what Jesus has done for you? We may be terrified about it. We may think, oh, I don't know enough. And if that's the case, I need to learn some more, certainly. But, but I'll never really know enough to, to be able to do it all on my own power. It just doesn't work that way. We may be afraid to share, but we can't be ashamed to share. And let's ask God to help us overcome our fear and our sense of inadequacy so that we too can say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. This morning, if you find yourself here in this room or watching online and you realize you're separated from God in a place called, or, and you're headed for a place called hell, you may not even know that. This may be news to you. Let me just say, that's not my message. That is the message of the Bible. And I want to be able to share with you what the Bible says about having faith in Jesus. But you can, you can make that decision today yourself by acknowledging your sin, repenting of or turning from your sin, believing Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin and then rose from the dead and then surrendering yourself to him. If you come by faith, you may not even understand all that, but if you come saying to the Lord Jesus today, I'm not good enough, I'll never be good enough, I accept what you did by faith, come into my life and take over, he'll save you. He'll save you today. In a moment, when, when we conclude the service, if you want to come find me or somebody else in the room here and share that you've made that decision or want to know more, please do that before you leave. Father, we call on you this day. And when we really stop and and we cut off all the noise of the busyness of this life and we think about who we are. First of all, we're reminded of how terrible I am, what a terrible sinner I am, how shameful I am, how undeserving I am. But then I come to terms with the, the fact that though I'm a terrible person, you are a great God. And though I'll never understand why you bothered with us, you have made a way for us to know you forever. And we're going to declare your greatness for all of eternity. And in the time that remains while we walk this earth, we carry with us the message of hope that other people desperately need to hear. And regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the times, I cannot be ashamed of the gospel. Empower us as your people with boldness that comes only from you. If there's someone here today who is listening in this room or online and they know they don't belong to you, they know they're still living in sin and they just don't want to let go or they don't know how, Lord, today, right now, through your Holy Spirit, speak to them with such great strength and power and clarity that they let go of the old way and embrace Jesus and the hope and transformation he brings. Thank you for saving us in Jesus' name.